we all were just starting once upon a time. So don't don't think I'm better than you are just because I've been doing this longer. Realize that we're all students and we all have to keep on learning. You know, if I can teach you something, I'm going to learn something from you too. Hello, welcome to The Seasoned RD, a podcast connecting newer professionals in the field of eating disorders to those of us who have been around for a while. I'm your host, Beth Harrell, a certified eating disorders registered dietitian and supervisor. And I'm Abby Brown, a registered dietitian who is newer to the field. I think of myself as a well-seasoned cast iron skillet with wisdom and experience, yet always ready for something new. And I think of myself as an Instapot with innovation and a fresh perspective. This podcast brings both to the table to share ingredients, recipes, and techniques of past and present so we can all be our best for the future. The kettle is heating up. A skillet is on simmer. So join us around the table for true professional nourishment. Abby, ready to stir the pot? Let's do it. All right, if you recognize that voice, you already know you're in for a treat. And her statement that we are all students, we are all teachers, including side by side with the client is the heart of this podcast. We all learn from each other. Our guest today is Dr. Margot Main. She is truly one of the founders in our field, founding the a founding fellow of the Academy for Eating Disorders and the National Eating Disorders Association. It's interesting how she talks about how she was told many years ago that eating disorders was just a fad. She's an author. Dr. Margot Main authors several books. We talk about father hunger, pursuing perfection, eating disorders, and midlife and beyond. And her most recent book that's not yet released goes way beyond eating disorders, but is about a woman's relationship with their hair and how hair is the forgotten aspect of body image. It tells our stories. The title is Hair Tells a Story, Hers, Yours, and Ours. I think you'll really enjoy this conversation. And a quick note from me, please do rate, review, and share this podcast so the message can get out to other professionals. And a standard disclaimer of what this podcast is and is not, we bring in medical, nutrition, and therapy professionals who share their passions to pique your interest in available modalities for the field of eating disorders. The show is intended to inform and educate. It's not a substitute for professional training and supervision required to specialize in the treatment of eating disorders, nor is it a substitute for medical, nutritional, or psychological advice from a professional or specialist. Welcome to the seasoned RD, Dr. Margot Main. We're so happy to have you. Thank you, Beth and Abby. This is a thrill to be able to talk to you. I was telling Margot, and when we were just chatting before we started, how her name is one of the most popular names we've heard on this podcast. So we are really excited to chat with you today. I have a couple of icebreakers just to get into things. Mountains or beach? Mountains. Mountains. Well, that's a a tough one. You really should say mountains, beach, or lake. And I would say lake. Oh, that's a good point. Yes. Right. Okay. You know, I might pick lake as well. I'm a lake girl myself. Good. Yeah. We got that. Yeah. Uh, Breakfast or dinner? Mm, Breakfast. Okay. Breakfast all day long is good. Uh Uh-huh. I agree. Breakfast or dinner. (laughs) You like breakfast foods? I do. I do. Mm -hmm. And just, you know, mentioning food, I am, my brother always jokes and says, have you ever skipped a meal? Like, I have never had an eating disorder, but I'm, you know, with all my eating disorder patients and people, and I take it really seriously that we have to feed our bodies and nourish ourselves. That's right. Yeah. I always tell my patients, I walk my talk and I don't expect you to do something I haven't done. (laughs) I love it. All right. Audio book or paper book? Paper, paper, paper. You know, I love trees and I don't want them cut down, but I, I love the texture of a book. I also like to read newspapers. I do read a lot of stuff online for newspapers. Books I rarely read online unless that's the only way I can get them. Mm -hmm. But I love the feeling of a book. I like to, you know, turn the pages down. I like to have an idea of where that segment was in the book. And I love to pass my books on to other people so that other people get to read it too. So I love, I love that. 
Mm. And that's what this podcast is about, bringing in the old and the new of like mm-hmm. papers. There wasn't such a thing as audiobook or a online book or an online newspaper back yeah. in the day. So I'm going to, I don't know, maybe, maybe traumatize you a little bit. You can let me know. <laughs> you are a psychologist. Yes. Yes. So on a board exam that you had to take, I want to bring you back to that day because people think about Dr. Margot Main and they think, oh my gosh, she's just, you know, way <laughs> up here and we, she's not experienced the human things that oh, we right. have. <laughs> so I imagine that that was it on paper and pencil because there was no computer at the time. Yeah, definitely. It was paper and pencil. I mean, computers existed, but you didn't have them. They weren't part of your regular, regular life. Yeah. I mean, so even my you... dissertation, I wrote by hand and then somebody else word processed. It was right oh. around the time that like people were all getting computers. So at the, as soon as I finished, I think my dissertation, yeah, my dissertation, I ended up getting a computer, but I, but before that people were processed and I wrote by hand. By hand, and your yep. research had to be going to the library and grant. Yes, spent a lot of time in the and... University of Connecticut Med School Library. Yep. Mm. Okay, so what about that exam day? Do you remember when you were passing a board exam or a licensure yeah. exam? Yeah. Yes, I remember the anxiety in the room, and I had a friend who was also taking the exam that day, and he had he had been really really anxious throughout the whole process, and he had not passed a couple of times. So we had, you know, kind of supported each other a little bit through the process. But I remember that day not wanting to talk to him. (laughs) I didn't want to catch his anxiety. Thank you very much. I remember leaving. And the only thing I could remember about the exam were the questions that I didn't know the answer to. So here you've taken this exam and you've, you've known the answer to a lot of things. But the couple of things that you didn't know like just stuck with you, like, like glue, you know, that's what I remember. Yeah. And you didn't find out right away like people do today. No, I'm, I'm thinking it was a month or six weeks. It might've been longer, but yeah, there was, there was a time gap for sure. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. Well, thanks for bringing us back to that. Cause the, the anxiety is very real and there, the, our listeners include people who are in the process of school or undergraduate or graduate school, as well as people who have been highly seasoned over the years. Yeah, yeah. So when Abby said that she's heard your name so many times, we always ask people what their resources were. And a lot of your books have been resources for folks coming mm-hmm. up in the field, as well as clients. Well, what are you what are you into these days? You're one of the pioneers in the field, and we were talking with Beth McGilley, and just kind of there were there weren't a lot of resources for you. Yeah. Uh, there were not, and my partner in practice, Rob Weinstein, who has worked with me for you know several decades now, we have this joke because I always would tell him when he he's a little bit younger than I am, so I had hired him, and I I told him that when I was you know, starting my dissertation process. And I decided to write my dissertation about eating disorders. And I was practicing pretty much all with eating disorders, running an eating disorder program. This is back in the very early 80s. My mentors and supervisors all told me not to specialize in eating disorders because they were a fad. And and I would have nothing to do. So I have to tell you, You know, it's 40 years plus, and I've never had a day when I don't have anything to do. Oh, my gosh. I knew intuitively that what we were beginning to see was only, only the start of a horrible, horrible trend. I knew that, you know, these at that time, you know, generally teenage and young women who were battling their bodies so much and expressing so much through their bodies and through their weight and through what they did to manage their weight. I knew that this was not going to go away. I knew that the cultural images and pressures on girls were only going to get worse. And, you know, damn it all, I was right. Mm-hmm, you <laughs> um, were. I, I wish I were wrong because, you know, we all have seen the heartache and heartbreak that these eating disorders cause. So, but I was unfortunately quite right. 
So every now and then, Rob and I joke, oh, this thing is just a fad. We're going to have to figure out what we're going to (laughs) do. Okay. And you've been doing this for over 40 years. Yes, right. (laughs) Hmm. So what was your first book? My first book was Father Hunger, Uh Father's Daughters and Food. And I remember exactly the inspiration for that book. First of all, I, I had a really wonderful father and a really good relationship with him. But when I was working with my patients and eating disorders and trying to read as much as there was available to read at the time. There wasn't, there wasn't a lot, but there was some, most of the clinical work talked about mother daughter issues and fathers were like, never, ever mentioned. Maybe they were mentioned in terms of like, they should help to push chicken legs down the girl's throat kind of not, not quite that, but almost, you know, that they were like the enforcer in some way. But I was in a patient's room one day. It was a patient who had just been admitted. She was a teenager. I remember exactly the light in the room and all of that. And I was doing my intake questions with her and asking her for a family background and all of that. And I kept on asking her questions about her mother because what I was reading was how important the mother-daughter relationship was and all of that. And she kept on answering me with things about her father. And I kept asking about her mother and she kept talking about her father. It kind of went back and forth for a few minutes. And I had this kind of aha moment. And especially in light of the very close relationship I had with my dad, but I had kind of ignored that in all of this trying to assimilate the information and research on eating disorders and understand girls' experiences. So I started to realize that there was something missing from our equation. And that's that was kind of the beginning of thinking about, we need to look at this. And, and so I I started to look at it more with my patients and families and all of that. So that was the inspiration for that. Mm. But all of my books, including my most recent book, Hair Tells a Story, Hers, Yours, and Ours, they've all been kind of the first book written about a topic. So I wrote the first book about fathers. My next book was Body Wars. Mm. And it was about the ways in which we can fight back against the cultural wars our culture puts us into with our bodies. And then my next book was, when you write this much, you forget. I know. I'm looking at this this (laughs) bookshelf behind you and it's just packed. Yeah. No, I think the next book was Effective Clinical Treatment of Eating Disorders, The Heart of the Matter. And that was the first book that talked about the gap between research and practice. You know, what we learn in school is very, very different from what we have to face every day in practice. You know, a lot of research excludes, for example, people who have comorbidities. So they have more than one problem. But if you only if you only have an eating disorder, you can get into the study and we'll study you and all of that. But if you have more than one problem, you're not in the study. So it doesn't really speak to the diversity of our patient population. You know, and a lot of the research is done on college age girls because they're available mm-hmm. <laughs> to mm-hmm. be studied, et cetera. So it's an exceeding number of gaps in the research between the research and practice. So that was my next book. And then I wrote, and when I say it was my next book, it was an edited volume. And so it wasn't just my work. And that has been certainly a good experience as well to work with other authors and be able to write a much broader book. And then, oh, Treatment of Eating Disorders, Bridging the Research Practice Gap was my very last one. Oh, oh, no, that was not my last one. It was not your last one because I'm holding one that you haven't mentioned yet. <laughs> but uh, that was with Beth <laughs> McGilley, right? <laughs> uh, then I wrote The Body Myth mm-hmm. in 2005. I think that came out, which was my first book about adult women and eating disorders. And then I did a reissue of that, Pursuing Perfection, mm-hmm. which is the one you have just recently read. Mm-hmm. And my newest book is about women's relationship with their hair. So I wrote the first book about adult women, midlife women also. So it's it's been interesting to be kind of on the cutting edge. Yeah. But there I feel like with each of these topics, you know, I'm just I am just the tip of the iceberg. There's a lot more to say. You know, I often feel like people see me as this expert. And yeah, I am, but we're all experts. Right. And you bring to me your expertise. Our patients bring their expertise and mm-hmm. we put it together and we will be really good experts. But an expert who just sits by herself writing at the computer is not much of an expert. Is not much of an expert. <laughs> so what I want to know what what started the idea of the hair, the book about hair. Okay. Yeah. 
Well, I think all of my books are because I listen to people. When I was saying I listened to that that girl, I remember I could tell you her name, but I'm not going to. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, And uh, it's a long time ago now. So listening to women's stories, really, that's what gets me to think about book topics. So I'll tell you the specific story that got me thinking about the relationship we have with our hair. And it's specific to eating disorders, although my book is not specific to eating disorders. We had a patient we had treated. She was a mid-high school girl. She had a very serious eating disorder. It was back in the day when we did relatively long inpatient stays. She was probably in for maybe two months, you know, somewhere between six and 10 weeks, probably. And she had done okay in treatment. She had gotten through a lot of tough stuff. Her family was very involved. She was discharged from the hospital back to family and school and outpatient care with me and the team. And a couple of weeks later, I got a call in between sessions from the family. And the mom was really worried about her daughter, that she was suicidal and she could not wait till the appointment a couple of days later. So when she came in, this young woman, who I'm going to call Karen, had gotten her hair cut. And she wanted to do this because she wanted to, you know, this is a way of kind of leaving behind her eating disorder self and all of that stuff. And she hated the way it looked. And she did not feel she could live with her hair. And I never, ever, ever had thought of hair as, you know, a cause for suicidal ideation. But since that day, I've certainly seen it in my patient population. Mm -hmm. I've certainly heard the stories from other people. I've certainly Mm -hmm. heard that story from hairdressers when I talk to them. Mm. It is possible to like be that attached to the meaning we give our hair. So that was my first glimpse on this. And then I noticed that many of my my friends, including people in the field, you know, when you share a hotel room and you spend a lot of time together and I see how much time they spend on their hair. <laughs> and, and I don't. <laughs> um, you know, before when we were talking about having, you know, lakes and things like that in our lives. I spent a lot of time and still do at a lake, in a lake all summer. So having a really simple haircut was always really important to me because my hair was always wet. So I never, ever, I mean, I certainly have fussed with my hair from time to time and I go to the hairdresser and have it, you know, cut and stuff like that. But it, it doesn't really, it's not that big a deal to me. So when I've watched other women and how much time they spend on it, it really started to light up some other things for me. And then I certainly have seen what it means to my patients over the years, not just to that young woman, Karen. Mm -hmm. So that got me thinking about the power hair has in our lives. And I feel it's kind of like the forgotten aspect of body image. Mm, Wow. Yeah. It's a way we can transform ourselves. Yeah. And it's, it's easy, you know, you can cut it, you can, well, now the colors that are available, like I have patients who come in, you know, with a different color, because they're feeling different. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's kind of, it's fun. It's, it, it can be really good, but also can be a source of great pain for women. So that's what got me started on the hair book. And hair is a very rich subject. And it tells our stories. But there's a lot of racism and sexism and rigid beauty standards that are kind of thrown into that mix. So there's a lot to be said. Mm -hmm. That is such an interesting perspective. I've never really considered hair as a part of body image, but I mean, I have even said a thousand times, oh, it's a bad hair day. You know, it's, it's just going to be a bad day because of this. And I think your book is very timely as well. I don't know if you've related it to this yet, but in light of COVID, yes. there has been so many women suffering from hair, just people in general yeah. suffering from hair loss after COVID. Yeah. yeah. There's the hair loss after COVID. There was the, during the COVID when we couldn't go out of our houses, the women who did not get their hair colored, who, you know, decided then to not color them, color it themselves and not to go back to having it colored afterwards. So a lot of women now have gray or white or or dappled hair, if you will. And just the fact that we couldn't attend to it in the same way. It was also because of COVID, we've spent a lot more time online, (laughs) on Zoom and FaceTime and all those kinds of things. So we're seeing our our hair more. So that's been kind of face to face with Mm -hmm. not having as much control over how it looks, and then seeing yourself a lot. So for a lot of women, that's brought up lots of issues. You know, and then there's the people like, you know, Britney Spears is the example, a woman who shaves her head in a crisis. That happens a lot too. 
needing to make some major, major change. So mm-hmm. yeah, there's a lot there. But yes. you're, you're right, like it's not included in body image. If you read any of the body image books, they don't really talk about hair. Welcome to December. I will soon be opening my January through June supervision groups. Current supervisees are the first to know, followed by people who have signed up for my supervision freebies. Information is in the show notes. I wrote that and circled it, the forgotten hair, the forgotten aspect of body image. Yeah. And I, I, as you were talking about the client or the patient, the girl, I, I was thinking about a coworker year, many, many years ago who had gotten her hair cut and she was so upset about it that she was like on the phone at work getting hair, figuring out where she could get extensions. I did not understand that. But then like with the eating disorder, when malnutrition happens, hair falls out and it's about a six month cycle. And so that's one way that we can help people really nourish their bodies is by saying, how's your hair? What's going on with that? And sometimes hairdressers are the first ones to know. And I would agree with you, Beth. In fact, I do talk about, there's a chapter in the book about hairdressers, hairstylists, because I think they are important to our patients. They're important people in our lives. In fact, I, I even joke that hairstylists should be considered essential workers. Mm-hmm. <laughs> they do a lot for people. But for many of my patients, it's their stylist who gets them really thinking about, yes, that is the reason your hair is falling out is mm-hmm. because, and you really need to take care of yourself. Mm-hmm. And they can say things in a gentle and, you know, not confrontative way. Because they have a relationship. Yes. Right. Right. So I I did devote a chapter to that issue. I call it relational hair care. (laughs) I love it. And this should be an an essential. Yes. My hairdresser, by the way, is very happy with the book because she feels (laughs) like They've kind of come into power. (laughs) Well, I mean, back in the day, we used to talk about how dentists might be the first to notice bulimia nervosa. So the hair stylist can can notice some malnutrition happening. Hair can only grow if you have enough for it to grow. And and Margo, you knew that I had a pretty scary year this year. And when, when they had to put an emergency drain in my head, they shaved the very front of my, yeah. my it's growing back. I don't yeah. know. You Your hair see. looks fabulous. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And when you were talking about the meaning, I remember the first, so, so Abby had sent me, and this was such a beautiful thing, some hair wraps and some other things. And I was going to a baby shower and I remember feeling so Mm self-conscious. It just really is Mm -hmm. that aspect of body image that unless you are thrown into it, maybe you don't understand. Somebody complimented And I just could have cried (laughs) literally like, this is not me. This is not me. Yeah. Yeah. Well, think about it. It's one of the first things we talk about when a baby is born. Oh, you have so much hair. Yeah. You You should see the shock of black hair or the shock of red hair. um, She's got beautiful hair. It's true. I didn't think about that. That baby is so bald. You know, it is. It is. (laughs) It's the first thing people see as the baby comes out. And Uh it's often a topic of conversation. <laughs> yeah. I, my, my grandson was born just a few days after I got home from That's the hospital right. yeah. Yeah. and he has a little curl sometimes uh-huh. that shows up on the yeah. top. So <laughs> <laughs> this is a, such an interesting way to think about hair. I was excited to talk about this book. Beth told me it was coming out. This is not at all though, where I thought this conversation mm-hmm. would go. Yeah. It's, and it's almost like, Getting, you know, when you show your hairstylist, this is how I want my hair to look. It even makes me wonder, is part of that the face of the person who's wearing the hair? You know, it's almost like you want, it gives you a new sense of identity. Like if I get my hair cut, I'll look like that person. Right. Right. Yeah. I think that's a lot of it. And I think that people, you know, look to changes in their hairstyles in order to do some sort of transformational thing internally as well. And that's okay. That's, it's, that's always been the case for women, using their hair as a transformative factor. You know, the other thing, it seems to me, women feel less competitive about hair than they do about other aspects of body image. They'll talk about their hair and their decisions about their hair and their choices, et cetera, in a much less competitive way with other people. And often is the one thing that they feel good about. Not everyone loves their hair, but I think if you were to do a survey, 
you would find that women probably like their hair a lot more than they like other body parts. <laughs> and some women really, it, it is their safe aspect of body image. Mm, you know, we had a doctor who would ask the the kids, the teens and the young kids, what is, what about your, your body? Do you like, is there mm-hmm. a, something about, and a lot of them would say their hair or their hands or something yeah. that's, yeah. 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 Mm. Right. Yeah. And sometimes that's when you're, Trying to encourage motivation for recovery, sometimes saying that your risk of hair loss is increasing is the only thing that really kickstarts that motivation. Absolutely. And and some women will tell you afterwards that losing their hair was the most powerful statement. I have a couple of stories like that in the book. Can't wait to I, see it. <laughs> I certainly do use it as a motivating factor also, Abby. Like I, I, I didn't for a long time and then I started to use it and it became like powerful for people. <laughs> so I remember that... one girl coming in one week, she was a high school girl. And she said to me, she said, I had a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. I said, well, that's great. And she said, yeah, I've been listening to you. And, and, you know, I want to go to the prom. I want my hair and my nails to look good. Mm-hmm. I thought, honey, that's as good as any motivation there is. <laughs> Absolutely. That can help you eat a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. Yes. That's awesome. <laughs> So I've used it. Yeah. yeah. I would love to take you back to Father Hunger. So going on the the other end, your first book, this is a book, it has to be one of the books I have suggested to parents the most. Wow. But yeah, it's just, it's just such a good book. Thank you. But for those listening who are not familiar with Father Hunger, what would you say the premise is or even the relationship of the father to the patient with an eating disorder. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, just thinking back to when that book came out, it's interesting because I I was criticized by some people for not blaming fathers enough, and then criticized by other people by for um, for blaming them. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> I feel like the book was the first attempt to try to see you know how important fathers can be to their daughters. And they can be a factor that contributes to the eating disorder, but they also can be very much a factor that helps the daughter to kind of make peace with herself and feel good about herself. What I've noticed in father-daughter relationships is that often the father and the daughter are very close when she's young, like say till 10 or 12 and through there, when she's starting to go into more pre-adolescent activities and, you know, talking to their friends on the phone and going to the mall and doing things like that are more important than spending time with dad. But until that point, often girls and their fathers have a close relationship. You know, she might follow him around on a Saturday doing errands and stuff like that. But then when she becomes more focused on her pre-adolescent, adolescent life, fathers often feel kind of a narcissistic injury that they feel kind of left out of the girl's life. And in general, this is going to be not true for everyone, but generalizations are sometimes like helpful. Fathers will kind of distance themselves because they're not sure how that they, how they can stay close to their daughters during this time. They they don't know how to stay close. So that's part of what happens in adolescence that fathers and daughters have this kind of natural pulling apart a little bit. And then as she's dealing with other issues, like the pressure she feels about her body, as her body develops, the pressure she feels from from guys, from other girls, from the media, and all of that, she doesn't have her father's voice and support kind of in there. And often during that early adolescence, mothers and daughters have a little bit of conflict. There's a little bit of tearing apart there too. And so it would be nice to have dad's support when that was happening. So if she doesn't have that, there's a lot of ways in which a father's support could could be really important during that time. Also, of course, fathers who are critical of women's bodies, whether it's their wives' bodies or when they watch things on TV and constantly comment about the what the women look like, all of that, or the father's issues with his own body or his concerns about weight, all of those things just kind of become a mess for a daughter to deal with. And it can really, really contribute to negative thoughts about food that are are certainly fed by our culture. Mm. Wow. I love it. I just remember some examples of a psychologist and Margo, you've met her, Michelle Mitchko here. Yes. I love Michelle. Kansas City. I love Michelle. 
Hi, hi, Michelle. I'm trying to get her to do a podcast episode. She's a little nervous. So um, I'll, I'll let her listen to this part of it and say, she, come on down. Ready. Yeah, come on down. <laughs> but she had talked about how fathers too can be like when, they're bo- when their daughters start developing that that they can feel uncomfortable yes. like with the, with right. other things of sitting on their lap or put, yeah. giving them a hug or you know they may feel unca- incapable so i'm going to shift though to this other the book pursuing per- perfection eating disorders body myths and women at midlife and beyond i had a watch party. We've watched so many webinars, you know, in our professional world in the next, in the past two years. And (laughs) there was one that was getting ready to expire. And I just kind of said, you know, I'm going to be watching it at, at this time, come to my office if you want to watch it with me. (laughs) And someone I would, I had pulled up this book before we got started. And one of the therapist said, what is perfection anyway? It's the death of creativity. And that's on page 132. It's Diane Keaton's quote. Yes. That was so powerful for me too, because one of just the day before my client had said, you know, I know when my eating disorder is, or is getting better because then I have all this creative energy. Mm-hmm. And then she pulled out this quote and I'm like, yes, what is that perfection anyway? It's the death of creativity yes. and eating disorders and comparisons and perfection are just, yeah. that's a yeah. bottom line. Yes. Right. Right. Yeah. I think perfection feels like the answer for so many women in our culture who struggle with, you know, who am I? Am I good enough? That's uh, women never get the message that they are good enough. Yeah. Um, so we're always we're always, you know, on the bike, kind of going around and around and around on a stationary bike, <laughs> trying mm-hmm. to hit perfection. And it doesn't exist. And I think Diane Keaton's words are powerful. It is, it's the death of creativity. It's the death of our self and our soul when we are so bound to trying to be something that we cannot be. And mm. the concept good enough is something that I often talk about with my patients. And I've had some patients who will say, in fact, one physician who I treat said to me, oh, you need to know good enough is the enemy of perfection. And she had learned that in med school, that good enough was the enemy of perfection. That was a statement that they used to make. So she oh. carried that in her heart and in her career that she has to be perfect in all measures, which include her body. And that's why she met me, but that she's never, ever good enough. Wow. 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 You know, it's perfection. It is. And that's some of the problematic language and things that have just baked into our brains and over time. It, it's funny because right before you said measuring something, measuring, I was going to bring up the measuring stick because what are you measuring against when right. you said I'm never good enough? Right. Right. How often are you pulling out that measuring stick and how yeah. likely is it that you're ever going to reach whatever that goal yeah. is? Yeah. And, you know, to get back to Abby's question before about fathers, this all ties together because if fathers, especially as girls are going through adolescence, can give that message that they're good enough, she's much more likely to feel good enough because she's not going to get that from most other places. See the full circle that you're bringing it back to? All these books have that thread and it's through the experience that you've given and, and to, and for welcoming in the old and the new thoughts and moving forward with it. And, and, and all of your books you had said kind of started with a, this hasn't been done before. So yeah. I'm going to be the voice for this. Yeah. yeah. If, a, if a father can, can help their daughter with a feeling confident and good enough, yeah. they're less likely to fall into the eating disorder if right. that's their genetic predisposition or and then we have to help fathers, you know, if the eating disorder has invaded their lives, to help them understand this, the really good ways they can help a daughter through it, because they can be great resources mm-hmm. and, and they can be great partners to the daughter's mother. But too much blaming and antagonism can get going also because of the anxiety and fear that an eating disorder brings into a family. Mm-hmm. And I know that these books are and this podcast is specifically relating to eating disorders, but it feels like this can reach past that population, reach to so many different groups. 
Absolutely. Let's be grandiose and say it's really for everybody. It's for everybody. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I think the father-daughter relationship is important no matter what. And I think women who don't have eating disorders also are pursuing perfection. And I think hair is an issue for all women. So I do think they're universals. I think there's lessons to be learned from the eating disorder population that can help everybody else. Absolutely. And, and you said women, but also men and hair. You yes. know, I, yeah. I would always envy how my husband could just go out and use the number three, whatever <laughs> he's done. But you know, so- I do think that, that hair can be an issue for men as well. And a lot mm. of people told me I should write about men too. I, I, I didn't want to, because I'm not an expert on men. I mean, I do have some male patients and I have a lot of men in my life, life and, um, but I, I don't feel I'm an expert on that. And somebody else should write that book. Yeah, <laughs> there you go. <laughs> but men have issues about their hair too. Yeah. Also, men have been very, very interested in the hair book. Lots of men will, mm. they want to understand the women in their lives. And, you know, they've had wives or daughters or sisters or friends and seen mm-hmm. how much attention, anxiety they get going around their hair. So sure. it's been kind of interesting to watch that as well. Yeah. I mean, when you said that too, about the, all, all the pieces, it's like medications can cause hair loss or, or, or chemotherapy or can change the color or the texture. There's so many things beyond just eating disorders and, and the men in, in the women's lives who are experiencing this meltdown from it makes a lot of sense. I have to say and again, this podcast is like, what have we learned over the years and what what can we learn from? The old playbook was parents are the problem. So yeah. when you said fathers can be great resources, absolutely. Thankfully, mm-hmm. we know that now yeah. through our research, but also just through experience. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. They're not to be blamed, even if they have had difficulty understanding the eating disorder. You know, we have to help them to understand. I don't think it's easy for men to always understand the complexities of women's bodies. Our bodies are and our psyches are all tied together in quite <laughs> quite a, a mess sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> and we have to help men to understand that. We can't expect that they're going to intuitively understand all of that. Mm. But sometimes we kind of give up on them. And we think, oh, they're not going to understand. Yeah. That's not right. We have to help them. Abby, you have. I do. Yeah. I, but I could just like keep talking, (laughs) (laughs) but I do have a wrap up question for you. So if you were to take yourself back to entering the field of eating disorders, what do you wish you would have known then that you do know now? Ooh, no, it's a loaded question. Yeah, that sure is. I think the most important thing I've learned over time is how important the relationship is how important building the sense of self in your patient is. And that the best way to do that is through a strong, affirming, positive relationship. So although it's also important to learn theories and techniques and all of that, that isn't what really gets a person better. What gets a person better is the feeling of being important to another person, that their their lives are worth living, that they are in fact good enough. So the, the most important thing is this good solid therapeutic relationship, I think. And all the other stuff is kind of gravy. It's important to know the medical aspects and get them really, really good medical follow-up and care. It's important to know how to work with someone who's going through trauma or other issues. It's important to help them modulate their mood and use medication if that's needed. All of those things are important, but the only way that's going to work is if that person feels important to somebody in their world. And that person is going to be a therapist or a dietitian who's by their side and who keeps on affirming them. Mm-hmm. So I think the most important thing is that therapeutic relationship. Yeah. Uh, that goes really, really side by side with what Dr. Beth McGilley had said mm-hmm. is you could have given me all the tools and I would have been an A plus student and I wouldn't have gotten better. But if you can sit still with me for a very long time Mm -hmm. and help me grieve, 
Yeah. That's where I'm, the healing is going to be. And Margo, I'm so really glad that you had mentioned relationship because I wanted to say, and this is not a, a client therapy relationship, that my own time with you, that you and Beth McGilley had welcomed me into the field of eating disorders and gave me a gift that I have hanging in my office at home of three women standing side by side and we all do this together. Yeah. I thought, wow, they just gave me me. Yeah. Yeah. yeah little yeah. me. Yeah. yeah. In this together. We're in this together. And I get to be with you as part of that. And I'm like, I'm not worthy of that. But I, I really believe I've been taught from you as great teachers that we are all in this together and that that relationship makes a huge difference. Well, thank you, Beth. You know, one of the things that bothers me a little bit when we speak at conferences is that often people will, you know, in the question and answer part or later come up to me and say, you know, uh, kind of apologize for not knowing too much, for just starting to learn about eating disorders. And that really gets me upset because we all were like, we all were just starting once upon a time. So don't, don't think I'm better than you are just because I've been doing this longer. Realize that we're all students and we all have to keep on learning. You know, if I can teach you something, I'm going to learn something from you too. Yeah. So we're all students. Not only, you know, we were talking about the relationships with our patients. It's also the relationships that we have as healers. I think that we have to model that for our patients. One of the things people with eating disorders are very good at is trying to do everything alone. They don't even need food. I don't need it. So by modeling our relationships and showing how we rely on each other, that's a way for our patients to learn that in life, it's okay to need sustenance. Sustenance mm. from relationships and sustenance from food. Absolutely. And you say in course two, like finding your tribe or finding your group. Yes. And so I'm saying that because this is a podcast for professionals is finding your dietitian, your therapist, your medical doctors, the people who are your people, yeah. who you're going to be side by side with. And we're all doing this together. Yeah. Margo, thank you so much for your time today. Well, Beth, I always enjoy talking with you. And Abby, it was great to meet you. I hope that I see you in person sometime soon. Yes, absolutely. Like maybe February, I end up. <laughs> <laughs> Let's lean on each other and learn from each other so we can grow together as professionals in this field of eating disorders. If you want to connect with me for supervision or membership with monthly content, please find me at bethherrell.com slash professionals.